Okay, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, this first day will be mainly more on information, okay? So installation, we'll be doing that anyway. We have two weeks to, to do the installation, do the programming and everything. Um, let's go to that uh, file. So MX1, it can be installed in many ways. It can be by using the industry standard server or it can be through virtualization. And of course, by using the Mitel own server, the ASU server, basically the ASU2. If you are having the old ASU and the ASUE, it will not be applicable for version seven. You cannot install it. The main reason for that is the, the memory, the hard, uh, the hard disk space on the, on the new ASU2. And one more thing. But yes. I have ASU and 7.3 is installed in that. Yeah, uh, that is ASU too. Anyway, you will see it as ASU. It's not mentioned on the card as ASU too. It's just plainly ASU. But for us, okay. ASU too, if the cup, if the memory is like 16 GB. Okay. So you can still use that for a small, like a demo kit, that is fine. But for a deployment, no, you have to use the latest one. Actually, there is the very latest one, which is ASU3. Now, the difference between ASU2 and ASU3 is the hard disk space and the memory. ASU2 is having 16 GB and 320 GB Hard disk SSD. Uh, it depends on uh, the SSD that that you you got from Mitel. Now, in in ASU three, it's double. Thirty two GB, five hundred twelve GB SSD. One slot only. Yeah, one slot only. But you can have another slot for mirroring. Okay, so why do we have this change on the ASU part? It's because you can also use it for as a virtual machine now because it's 32, right? So you can do virtualize, virtualization. Okay, uh, it's running on a SUSE Linux 16, uh, SUSE Linux 12, 64 bit, service pack 5. That is the very latest one. You can also do some SIP trunking, CSTA connectivity, web services, and support IPv4 and IPv6. Still, I haven't seen an IPv6, but the system is compatible with IPv6, if in case it will be out there in, 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 the, yeah, in the network. Now, during the installation, it will ask you are you going to use IPv4 or IPv4 and IPv6? Now we are still using IPv4. Uh, can we require any other hardware for SIP trunk? With no. 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 We don't need any hardware for SIP trunk. Because, uh, oh, hard, oh, okay, hardware. You, oh, yeah, yeah. I will explain about that, uh, the SIP trunking later on. I know what you mean. So now IPv4. If you install the system IPv4, it will only require you IPv4. If you select IPv4 and IPv6, mm -hmm. then you must provide an information about the IPv6 mm -hmm. as well. Now, when you install it on IPv4, and later on you will try to install, because there will be IPv6, in, if you want to do it, you, will, you, can, you are not allowed to do it. You have to reinstall the system mm -hmm. and select IPv4 and IPv6. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you cannot change it on the Linux part. Maybe you have to reinstall it. Maybe yeah, yeah. Uh, Maybe there are some benefits with IPv6, but I haven't seen it. Maybe there are, uh, three functions there. Yeah, maybe a few functions that is added to the network. Yeah. Okay, so components, we're talking about the components. 
uh, MX1 communication system consists of four main components. One is the service node. So when you say service node, so it refers to the server itself, what is built into the server, which is the Linux-based uh, operating system, okay? This is referred to as a limb. Before, during Ericsson time, we call the server as mm -hmm. limb. Limb one, limb two, up to one, limb 124. Now, because it's a server base, we call it now service node. Again, you might see some limb in the documentation because Mitel did not remove it from the programming. It's still there, okay? There are some parts that it mentioned limb. So now we call each server as service node. That's why when I draw it a while ago, I referred to it as service node one to service node 124. Media server, as I, as I told you a while ago, media server is part of the installation. It is built into the operating system. You just need to activate it. DSP resources for handling tone detection, multi-party features, and packet switching between endpoint, IP protocol, SIP, and H323. Simple as that. Okay. Nowadays, there is no H323. Do I need to activate the media service? It's up to you. You can activate it uh, to add more resources. Okay. Media service for playing messages, music, and streaming services. Now, the difference between media server and media gateway is because media gateway is the hardware base. We talked about it. If you need TDM connectivity, you need uh, an MGU or a media gateway 3U chassis. Okay. It can be added, com uh, complement with TDM baselines. Again, the ELU34, TLU83, the different cards that we have for line cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's more related to this topic. But uh, what's PMU? I okay. Forget. Before, during Ericsson, I, during Ericsson, mm -hmm. for us to give a tone to the system, we must have a TMU card. So TMU is also the one providing resources for digital, mainly for digital. Mm -hmm. Now, during Ericsson, an analog card will have its own tone generator. That's why when you pull out one card, there's a big, massive device on the ELU 29 or the, or the olden cards, okay? There is a big, like a... The speaker like. It's, it's a metal with coil yeah, yeah. that provides tone to your analog card. Mm -hmm. Now, TMU provides that for the, di the digital. For digital. For digital only. If you remove that, your digital phone will not have a dial tone. You cannot activate the 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 operator unit before, which is the DBC four two two four. You cannot activate that without the team. That is the only main purpose of that. Now, I have a new service. I have a new system. Is TMU still there? No. That will be on your old system. If you have an old system like six point three, you might still have it or 5.0, you might mm -hmm. still have the TMU. Remember the DSU, LSU, mm -hmm. all of these things. So it's a part of that component. But now you don't need a TMU. Okay. Let's say you might you might tell me how come I still have a TMU in one of my installation. That is because you have a digital card. And though the digital card, you have an operator, you still need the TMU. Every operator, DBC4224, needs a TMU. That's why you might still have it in one of your installations. If you try to remove that, your operator will not work. Simple as that. Okay? Uh, also provide DSP resources like the media server. Like uh, I explained to you what is the number of RTP resources on that media gateway, which is 160. Yes. External gateways and controllers these are the new devices that we have. We call it EX and GX gateways. Now, EX and GX gateways, these are two different controllers. I, I, let me open my, actually, this is a pre-sales uh, 
presentation that I provide to people, to pre-sales. I'm also doing pre-sales. So that EXGX is this one. Okay. It is another controller. Okay. It's a full IP telephony call control gateway. This EX and GX are mainly used for branch offices. If you have a customer who have branch offices, rather than providing them a 3U, let's say they will only have 20 users. Why should I buy a big system where I only need 20 up to 200 users? Then you can provide an EX gateway. An EX gateway can provide up to maximum of, uh, it also has provide mailboxes, 120 port for switching for voicemail, and it can provide up to 1,400 IP users for a small branch office. It does not need IP base. IP base. Not only that, it also has some slots where you can put different type of connectivity. Same. Effect. And analog is there. Analog is there. Same FXS. Yeah. FXO, FXS. So it's a module. You can put modules. Okay. You have. E1, T1, connectivity, expansion slots. And then you have house card to connect TDM trunking, ISDN, PRI, okay, analog trunk, FXO, analog extension, FXS. So everything is available on this. And at the same time, you can have a dual power supply as well. So the good thing about this EX controller is that... Where is the second port? Oh, I mean, you can add another power supply on that one. Uh, the good thing about this one is it runs on KBM environment. To, to, give, to give you a history, this is not a Michael product. We bought it. We enhance it. Okay? If you look at it as, as it is, it will work as a telephony, purely IP. It's like an ATA. Okay? The ATA system. It will work by itself without any MX1. Now, if you want to have a feature of MX1, you can install MX1 on top of it. That's why you have a KVM environment. Okay. So the operating system, it already have an operating system that you can configure an analog trunk, an analog extension, an IP extension as a remote site, okay? The programming is based on the application that is built into the system. Now, what if I need to have unified communication? I need to have auto attendant and so on. I need a PC-based operator. This one cannot provide it to you. That's why we can install an MX1 platform on top of it. What is the capacity of analog uh, extensions here? For this one, uh, based on the, it will be based on the number of spaces that you have. I'm not familiar with can it. Can we increase this? Uh, yeah, you can, but uh, I don't know if this mentioned, uh, it's not mentioned here. I, I will look into that one, uh, what will be the capacity of that one. This is the ASU2, the difference between ASU2 and ASU3. As you can see, uh, the core processor is the same. Uh, maybe the i7 is different, maybe a new generation, and then 32 GB, and then solid state uh, hard disk, 512 GB. Okay. So this is the EX controller. I don't, I don't know if I have the GX. The difference between GX, yes, sir. Any question? You have a question? No. Okay. The difference between the GX, where is my GX? Uh, I don't have the GX here. Now, the thing with the thing with the GX, ah, uh, this one, this is the GX. Okay. With the GX, this is only for up to 206, 24 FXS, okay? Now it depends how you how you will buy the GX. The GX have many types. As you can see, I cannot add any more cards on it. 
there is no additional module. If you buy the GX, you will buy it with FXS, FXO. There is also a GX with PRI, FXS without FXO. So it's a default, uh, how can you say it? It's a default gateway depending on your requirement. Now, let's say I bought a PRI FXS and later on I need an FXO. Someone from MITRE is calling me for a while. Hello? Yes, morning, mom. Yeah, I'm starting the thing. Uh, no, no, I, I, I removed that one because I need the, because I need the port. Uh, no, I'm, I'm here in the office right now. I'm here in the conference. Uh, maybe in, in one hour, two hour time, lunch time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No issues, no issues. Okay, okay. Okay, 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 okay. Sorry about that. So going back to that one, again, these are fixed gateways. I might say fixed gateway because there is no module where you can add additional line cards, okay? So it depends. If you require less than 200, then you go with GX gateways. But again, this one, the, the, the difference between this one and the EX this one has its own operating system, okay? You cannot put an MX1 on top of this one. So it has its own operating system. I can connect to it, I can configure it, but configuring it manually as a different system, okay? <coughs> so if you have question, huh, just ask. Okay, so let's go back to that one. So standalone hardware-based unit designed to provide branch office redundancy, okay? Provides telephony facility when a remote office is isolated in the main system. So when it says it supports branch office, how does it work? Let's say I have a service node one, okay? So this is connected to my network. Now this network, let's say you have a one or a different type of connectivity to your branch office. It can be an EX gateway or it can be a GX gateway, okay? So everything is connected uh, in a manner of the communication is happening to, to each network. Now, when it says it has its own redundancy, what happens is, let's say this one is connected to, to its own network and it has a SIP phone. So basically, when you have this set up, all of these phones, it registers to main server. Meaning this phone is registered to this main server. Even this phone is registered to the main server. Main, I uh, mean, oh, oh, sorry. You might say media server, main server. Okay. So again, it is connected here. So in when the connection is lost between the, the branch office and the head office, automatically this phone will be registered 
to the gateway. Okay. That's why it's called, it has its own redundancy. Okay. So basically that is how the design is. Whenever there is a fault, automatically this one will register on this one. The same goes with this one. Now, the, when the link goes back, that one will re-register back to the, to the main server. Now, when, when this link is down and you have your own FXO, you can use that FXO to make a call outside. Maybe you have a digital trunk, then you can use that digital trunk to call outside. So that's why it says redundant by itself. Okay, of course, we have a different redundancy on the part of this of, of the MX1, which we will be talking about next week. Okay, so that is the other service that we have, an EX gateway or a GX gateway. Now, no, Arnold, Arnold, one question. Yes, sir. Uh, licenses are installed in SN1 or and GX, EX uh, also yeah, only in SN1. Same okay. Licenses. If you have this uh, configuration, all the users that you have on this site, let's say I have 20 users, I have 10 to use, 30 users here. These licenses are present to this system. Okay? Now, do I need these licenses here? Yes, because you are registering to the main server. So meaning 30 must be here and another 20 must be added to your main server's SIP user license, okay? Without this SIP user license, there will be no re registration to the main server, okay? This one has its own license attached to it. That's why when it's broken, it will be running through that licenses. Okay. The trunk line, the FXO, the PRI, you don't need it here because it, the license for the PRI and the FXO is attached to your gateways. Okay. Only the SIP user. Is it clear? Okay, clear. Now, you might you might see some other type of connectivity. We can have connected one as a branch of. We call this one as remote limb. That's why I call it still them or remote service node. Okay, when you say remotely, again, as an then that is one single system, right? We call it remote limb. Why do we have a remote limb instead of this one? If your capacity is much bigger. Hello, sir. Beyond the limitation is Yes, sir. Sir, uh, external gateway and GX gateway. Uh, yes, if sir. external gateway uh, one connectivity is disconnected, then they cannot communicate with uh, server one, right? Yes. Uh, but uh, GX can communicate with uh, server one. But if the link of GX then it will rely on whatever you have here. All the phones will be registered on the GX. Okay. Okay, sir. So again, we call it. Okay, Arnold. Uh, it means that if we have a requirement uh, of 150 user, let's say 150 SIP user, client says that I need one SIP 50 SIP user, some ISTN trunk, let's say two or three then we can offer them GX instead of uh, 470, right? Without yeah, MX1, a, yeah. only GX uh, instead of MX uh, uh, 470. But basically these are the issues for MX1 branch office. 
right but uh, if if the requirement is very low let's say oh, there are again 100 users and two stn trunks isdn trunks then we uh, we can offer them this instead of uh, 470 because 470 is is much expensive than i think this one it it depends it depends on your requirement what is your requirement if you need auto attendant if you need operator those are features that this system will never have okay uh, uh, in a tent cannot be integrated with gx or ex no, no. Oh, okay okay right 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 okay got it in a you can have independent on ex when you have an mx1 it has its own os right now if you have cycle app one system here Without an MX1 system, it will just be horrible. Sir, I have a, I have a question. That uh, if the link is broken, then the operator uh, can't uh, register to GX or EX, right? Yeah, there is no operator for this two. Doesn't have any operator facility. or operator feature so so operator must uh, be registered on the service node yes so the, uh, if the link if the, if the link is broken then operator can't reach those uh, gx or ex users yeah only on ex again if you have an in attend let's say i have a pc based operator okay you have an in attend integrated with ex you must have an understand this integration only mx1 can understand if i an auto attendant i need the mitel uh my cam my tell uh, advanced messaging and i can only integrate that one if i have mx1 application uh, telephony on the system you will need a one yes sure yes sir no uh, for, for this hello sir uh so you have to in the gateway you don't need an asu that is because of the kbm Right, KBM is somewhat like a in an instance, a virtual instance that you install to the system. Yes, sir. Question. Hello, sir. Uh, yes. If the one connect one connection is disconnect with uh, external gateway, uh, they cannot communicate with uh, server on. But uh, can they communicate internally? Internally? Yes, sir. That's why it's called redundant by itself. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. It can, whatever extensions you have here, you, let's say you have an analog, or you have a SIF, they can talk to each other within that whenever this link is down. That's why it's called survivable branch office. It can survive by itself without any connectivity. But we cannot call ourselves. No, you can. If you have an FXO PRI, you can you can use your own. your own network connectivity that's why it's called survivability and okay is connected then you're uh, calling outside then it will it will, it will reroute it. your calls to whatever trunk line you have here you, you will have a different access code because you have a, you have let's say i have a pri here yeah, that, to make a call there that would be a different access code Now, when the link is down, of course, you will have your own access code to call outside using your. Then you have to configure here. And here. Yes, and for GX, you have to configure everything here. Okay. Now we have an application here called Provisioning Manager, yes. where we are allowed to communicate on that one, because let's say this is far from your head office. Do I need to go there to configure it? No, using a. provisioning manager application which we are going to install on our telephony 
I will be able to communicate on that one and configure everything. The same goes with the EX. Okay, from here then, uh, if it's connected, we are calling outside, then it will uh, work from here, PRI. Yes. If the connection is okay, it's either you use this PRI to call out or use your own with different access code. Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay. So no more questions. That's fine. Good. So, yeah. So these are the names. Now, our new product, we call it My Voice MX1. Before, it was Astra MX1 and so on. So those will be the new names. This is the service node manager, provisioning manager. We will talk about that. Uh, Cassandra, OK? Now, what is Cassandra? Cassandra is the main database that we have on version 7. OK, before, during 6.3, we are using Open LDAP database. Now, the problem with Open LDAP database is that this Open LDAP database only remains on the main server, which is the number one server. So every time that there, the, there is a data, it's not being shared to the other servers. That's why when it went down, that's it. Now, with Cassandra, each server will have its own database. Mm -hmm. So when you configure something here, it will be repopulated to all the system. That's why when the system is down, the main server is down, this particular system will work by itself. Mm -hmm. It will not rely because the data is there. Automatically, huh? Yeah, it's syncing automatically. Okay. Whenever you do a data backup, whenever you do a backup, it does a backup on all the servers. Whenever you do a change, it will be mirrored to all the database. That is why, that is also one reason why we are maximizing the memory and the hard disk space of the server. Okay. So this application, the performance analytics, advanced messaging, my contact center, enterprise, these are applications that you can integrate with the MX1, okay? MX1 chassis, we call it MX1 chassis before we call it MGW. Vital server unit or the ASU before it's ASU. Now in ASU, you might uh, be confused because my boys business also have ASU, but that ASU is for the analog server unit, okay? To provide you an analog extension on your my boys business. But that's why for us, we still call it ASU. If you if you see the board, it still says ASU. But that refers to application server. Okay. That is your Michael ASU. And then the 69 series phones. Now let's talk about the phones. We no longer have the 67 series because these are old phones. But what do we have is the 69 series and 68 series. All Mitel phones, all Mitel SIP will only work on Mitel SIP firmware. Okay. All phones, all the 68 series and 69 series must have a SIP firmware. Okay. Now, the thing is, with my voice business, 69 series is using a different firmware called MyNet. MyNet. That MyNet, if your phone is set to MyNet firmware, it will not work with MX1. You have to convert to SIP. And I will show you how to do that. Convert it to SIP so that it will work with MX1. Now, 69 series will only work within the Michael platforms. If you, if you sell it to Avaya, to Cisco, to Alcatel, it will never work. Because with minor. With SIP. With SIP. Yeah. Because it's not an open SIP. It's uh, it's hard coded to work only with Michael platform. Now, if you want to sell our phones to this different platforms, then you need to sell the 68 series because the 68 series is an open standard SIP. So it will work as a third party SIP for Avaya, for Cisco and, and Alcatel. It's the same with Cisco. 
You cannot use a Cisco phone not unless you buy a SIP license for the Cisco. The same goes with Abaya. Mainly it's IP. You have to put a firmware SIP so that you will be able to use it as a third party phone. Okay. Microsoft Skype for Business, you can also integrate it with an MX1 as well. Okay. There are many ways of having the telephony onto our system. We do have a recovery DVD. It's still on the document, but you will not receive a DVD anymore. Because nowadays, you cannot find a DVD player. Not unless you have a standard server, industrial standard server, they still have it. But uh, in some cases, like the ASU, there is, I, I cannot buy a DVD player anymore. Okay. So we also have a media kit only customer. Software only customer is also delivered. So what is the difference between the DVD and the software only customer? DVD or boot of or USB, it has the complete operating system and telephony system in that USB stick. The media kit is only to provide to a customer who doesn't want to buy the server from us. Remember, whenever you buy a server from us, it's either an ASU server or an industrial server that we sell to you. <clears throat> and Michael is selling industrial server in the form of Dell. We support Dell. Okay. Now, let's say you're the customer. I don't want to use Dell. We are a company who are using IBMs. So our recovery DVDs are not designed for IBMs. It can work with IBM, but you have to twitch some settings on the IBM BIOS, okay? Now, if you are going to provide your own server, what Michael will ask you is, is install your own operating system, which is SUSE Linux 12 SP5. Of course, there will be licenses attached to it. So you have to buy your own operating system, your own license for that. And then we will just give you the telephony software. That's why it says, Media kit for software only customer. We don't provide you the OS, but we provide you the telephony. Okay? That is what we call media kit. DVD can self detect whether installing a host, physical, virtual machine, VMware tools automatically. Operating system, it has an operating system slash 12, so Linux 12. And server system can be installed, has the following components. Telephony server is included on that DVD. Add Lim server to system, standalone, Cassandra, provisioning manager, it's all intact in that recovery DVD soft, uh, CDs or USB stick. Okay. Now, with virtual machine, uh, one more thing is this one. A downloadable version of recovery DVD ISO file is available from Mitel. So let's say... You, you have broken the DVD CD or you misplace it, you can go to the download software download center and download the ISO and you can reburn the DVD. Okay. It's a, it has to be a multi layered DVD because it's more than 7 GB, 8 GB. Now, virtual appliance, we can deploy our system to a virtual appliance. You can use that recovery DVD or you can download the OVA file. Because it's a virtual machine, you can install it on VMware ESXi, 6.5 to the latest, okay? So download the OVA file. Now the OVA file also includes everything, operating system and telephony and whatever you have saw there, Cassandra, the provisioning manager and so on. So everything is added to that one. Now, this is especially if you have a, um, a virtual environment. It can be VMware hypervisor EXI environment. It can be uh, Microsoft, um, what do you call that? <laughs> it's a, 
went out of my uh, uh, the virtualization of Microsoft. Azure. Azure. Azure can be used. That that is cloud based. That is a cloud based. Now there is another one, Hyper-B. Uh, the I forgot the, the Microsoft one. Let's see if it is here. Virtual machine and VMware and Hyper-B. Hyper-B, yeah, Hyper-B. So, so you can use all those things. Azure is also there, but here in Dubai, we don't have any data center that hosts Azure, but on the latest version, we support Azure, if you're going to deploy it in Azure, okay? So those are the only things that we support. Uh, the advantage of OV is that in the image of the system, ready built from the recovery, so again, everything is there. And it's a quick deployment. You just need to deploy it. Now, of course, when you deploy it, there is also a requirement for that, right? So the requirement for the VMware is basically, uh, where is that requirement? We only require this, okay? Processor, at least the processor is 2.4. You have a 16 GB, 1 to 120 GB space. Though we are providing you 512 on an ASU because of some other things, but virtual machine, it only requires this one. Okay? Land ports, you need two land ports. Okay? So again, virtual machine, hybrid or, or, uh, or uh, mixed with a server and a gateway. Okay, so that is a requirement. I will show it to you later on. Now, let's talk about system architecture. So when we talk about system architecture, how it is designed. So you have an operating system to host the telephony, right? So right now we, we are supporting SP5 because this document is version seven. So we have SP5 64 bit. Service system, system support functions such as install, start, backup, config, that is a part of the Linux that you can do from the Linux point of view. Now, telephony, on the telephony, you can execute control call handling function of the voice, okay? Service load manager, we talked about it. We have a service load manager and it hosts the service load manager application which is basically installed only on server one, automatically installed when you install the telephony. Provisioning manager, in the, in the other hand, if the number of user is 2,500, beyond 2,500, you have to install provisioning manager on a different server. But if you have less user, then you can install the provisioning manager within service node one or in any other service node, okay? But beyond that, you have to use an external server to install the provisioning manager. My voice MX1 consists of program units. So because it is a server-based application, uh, even during the, the MD110 time, all of the line cards or all of the feature is using a program unit. So it's like DDLs of Windows. So if you if you are having a problem with zip trunk or zip extensions, there are particular program unit that uses by those applications. So sometimes you have an alarm and it's telling you, you have an alarm on this program unit, then you focus on that program unit you can restart it, you can uninstall, install it. So this is also part of the troubleshooting when you are doing a, a fix on your system. There is a common program unit. There is also a regional program unit. Regional means it, it can be installed in any other service node. Common means all of the service node will have those program units as default, okay? 
So for example, I need a, a, an analog trunk and my analog trunk is on service node two. Then I can install the program unit of analog trunk to service node two. If I don't put it on service node one, what happens is that when you activate a TLU83 on service node one, it will not work. It will not accept it because you have to install that application. And uh, I will show you how to add those program units. These are just example of program units, okay? So if you are having a problem with license, then that is the program unit for license. Responsible program unit for call establishment. Maybe you are having a problem where a call is not happening. So you can check this program unit. Uh, SIP LP for controlling SIP trunk and SIP extensions. TLP 65 for uh, trunking, IP, IP trunking. SLP 60 is for ISDN trunk. So if you have some issues, you can always check this and so on, okay? So our main data structure, we have dynamic data, permanent data, which are included on the Cassandra database. So these are the dynamic data is our program units per server on the system. So permanent data, these are the backups that you create on the system, okay? So it will be always there on the server. Not unlike the dynamic data, it can be everywhere. Other data stored in Cassandra database, so a multi-master database which can be stored in numerous locations. Cassandra database accepts updates, replicate changes to other databases. That's why when you change something on service node one, automatically it replicates everything to the other server so that if something happens, that server can still work by itself, okay? We have two type of management suite. Again, as I mentioned to you, MX1 does not have an application that is partly correct and partly wrong because when you install a telephony, there is an application that is pre-installed together with the telephony. And that is your service node manager. The other one is MX1 provisioning manager another application but you have to install it separately it's not together with the telephony but the application is within the telephony you just need to install it what is the difference between the two service node manager is required per telephony system but when you say telephony system one single system and it is installed on service node one what is the main purpose of snm or service node manager this is to configure the whole system trunk line numbering class of service etc etc so all of these things provisioning manager on the other hand is totally different can i have a full system without a provisioning manager yes but when you are trying to install an extension you have to do it by a command line which will be a little bit problematic if you don't know the commands now, if you have a provisioning manager, you will be able to add extensions automatically through web programming. You don't need the command line. Mm -hmm. So another thing, is it only for telephony? No. If you have an, uh, an auto attendant, like uh, the auto attendant or the SIP deck, I can configure all those applications without going to that server. That's why it says provisioning manager. I can do everything here. If I change something from my telephony, automatically it will change the, the auto attendant, it will change the SIP deck and so on. It will be shared to all the integration that you have. And you can also integrate your Active Directory with the provisioning manager as well. But this is only one way. So if you change it from Active Directory, that is only one way. If you change something on PM on the system, it will not update your Active Directory. It's only one way, okay? Okay, Cassandra, this is a little bit uh, 
uh, a big information about Cassandra. It replaces the open LDAP of the MX1. So I, as I mentioned to you a while ago, the problem with open LDAP is that it relies only on one single server. And it cannot, it's not designed for big data. That's why we have a Cassandra database, okay? Cassandra works more on peer-to-peer -peer basis, meaning it, the changes can be made any or any copy of the database, these changes will be replicated to all the servers that you have on the system, okay? So these are information that uh, I think you, you can read it. What is decentralized flexible replication? So what are the different type of uh, Cassandra database that you can do onto the system, okay? Scalability, fault tolerant, okay? It can be, it can have its own redundant Cassandra database, okay? So a lot of things. <laughs> Some of them are more into programmers uh, language, okay? Those are the things, those are the terms that you, you will find in the telephony whenever we do the Cassandra database. You will find all those information there. Okay, so let's move on. Hardware architecture, software architecture. I know this is a little bit boring, but uh, we'll just get to know more about the MX fund. So, uh, yeah. Excuse me. Before we start, uh, we have a couple of licenses here. You, you have licenses? Okay. No, no, he's asking uh, any chapter. Uh, we'll discuss about Yeah, yeah, we will discuss about the license. Uh, we, um, how the license is processed. When can you get a license? Types of licenses. Type of licenses, we only have. Oh, you mean each license says. Okay, I'll explain it to you, no problem. What, uh, line by line, yeah. what are the licenses? Yeah, no problem. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So system installation, as I mentioned to you here, because this document is old, that's why classic cabinet is still there. But right now, we only support the 3U chassis, OK? As you can see, it's the document still Astra, the, the, the picture. Now, in each media gateway, you have one server, one media gateway in one RAM. OK, there are many ways to do this. Let me change my, I have to go to my board again <laughs> so that everybody can see. Okay. So as we mentioned, I can have a server that can be my SN1, but this is running on VMware or Hyper-V. Okay, yeah, now I remember. Hyper, Hyper, Hyper-V, okay? So with this one, this is purely IP deployment. So I'm using the server as a virtual machine so that I will be able to have a pure IP deployment. Now, I have another server. It can be, uh, it's also a purely IP deployment. It can be a Dell server, an IBM, and so on. As I mentioned to you, if it is a Dell server, automatically you can use the recovery DVD. But if it is a different uh, server, we will give you the software only. And client must provide their own Linux uh, application, SUSE Linux, okay? Again, purely the IP deployment. If you want EDM, then you add the gateways. Now, another way of deploying the system is having our own card. You have your MGU. OK. 
okay? And then you are going to use our own server. We call it ASU, now we call it ASU3, okay? So as you can see, if the client will not provide the server, then we are going to provide you a 3U chassis that has a server on it. And this server, when you receive it automatically, there is an uploaded operating system and telephony. You just need to boot up the whole box, put a, a monitor and a keyboard, that's all you need. And you will see the installation part. Now, if you have this set up, the next media gateway that you will have does not require any issue. Mm -hmm. So one, two, three, four, five. So you only require an MGU, and the rest will be PDM. MGU will be in PDM. PDM. Okay. So everything will be PDM. In a single server, you only need one ASU, that's all. Not unless you will tell me you have a redundant server, then you can have another ASU as your redundant server. Can I have this ASU here? Why not? You can have both ASU here. But what will be the problem? If this particular chassis broke down, you don't have the redundant server as well because it uses the same box. So that's why we don't design it that way. Okay? That's why we have a separate ASU. Now, can I have ASU and my redundant server as virtual machine? You can, but the thing is, depending on the specification of your server, if this server is much lower spec than the ASU, you will have a problem with redundancy, latency. Okay? So what do we require is you have to talk to your client. If this is how we are going to do it, you have to have an ASU because it has its own, the same specification. If you are going with this one, then use the same Dell or IBM uh, server. If you are using OVA, that is totally different because this one, this is an ISS, Industrial Standard Server. If you want to have a redundancy, it has to be the same type of industrial server. In OVA, it's different because this is a virtual machine what do we expect in a virtual machine? Let's say this is a virtual machine. Each instance is an image. Let's say this is my service node one. This is my service node two. And maybe this is a Windows. That is how we use the, the virtual machine. You can have multiple instance of application within one single server. But for you to have this, you must have a powerful server. It's not only 32 GB memory, it has to be more than that. Because again, this one uses 16, 16, and maybe your Windows, you want to use 16. So how many is that already? And if you want to add more instances, then it will use the resources of that server. Now, where is the redundancy here? We support HA and FT, fault tolerance and high availability. This is not a Mitel product. This is a VMware feature or product that you need to buy licenses to make it work. Now, if you're going to ask me, I'm not a VMware expert, then this has to be designed by a VMware expert from your company or for your customer's IT to deploy it. Okay? So 
So those are the different ways well, of them, doing redundancy. To deploy Sorry? Um, most of places, customers do not deploy this thing. They uh, supposed in Saudi? To, yes. They are not using VMware? Yes. They were supposed to complete uh, from us. Ah, okay. Then that, that's how you are going to do it. But in some cases here in Dubai, we have lots of companies working on this. They, they are uh, relying on the HAF. Anyway, a lot of customers nowadays here, they, they, they are mainly onto virtual deployment. Because uh, they, they started not to use analog as well, some of them. So they are more into IP. Okay, so rather having a headache with the with the cards, with those gateways, I will be having a headache with one single server. But of course, this is much more expensive because every application that you put there must have a license. Yes. It has its own memory and the hard disk space has to boost up as well. Okay, so that's that's the that's the difference. That's that's why we have. Like, Sir, yes, sir. Uh, Arnold, uh, CPQ suggests that the network and server redundancy in yeah. the next one. Okay. It is different from HAFT? Yes, it's different. Okay. Now, I, I'll give you an example <laughs> now that you talked about it. HA and FT. FT is where there will be 100, per, not 100%. 99.99 .99 reliability, meaning if the server goes down, if you have an FT, while you're on the call, you'll still be connected. We're talking about IP mm -hmm. because you are connected to the network. Already, the resource is already being used. Now, when you say FT, if another person lift up the phone, they will hear a dial tone right away. So there is no um, discrepancies on that on the on the voice. We are using this type of redundancy because this is server redundancy. In Mitel, we do have a redundancy called. So I will change it. Is it okay, right? Uh, I'll put it there. We we have. N plus one redundancy. So let me talk about the redundancy first and then I will go to the network. N one plus one preload redundancy. What is the difference between the two? N plus one means Let's say I have, let's talk about N plus one redundancy. N plus one means I have multiple servers. SN3, SN2, SN1, one single system, okay? Now all of them are connected to the same network. Now without redundancy, this one goes down because of Cassandra, all the phones here can communicate to each other and so on. So how do we have a redundancy? We'll have another server. It can be a media gateway with ASU. It can be this server. So we will call this one redundant server. Okay, one N plus one means you are going to create what we call cluster. Mm -hmm. In one single cluster, I can cluster up to 10 service nodes. What does it mean? I only have three, that's fine. It's one cluster, but I can only up to 10 service nodes as one cluster. One cluster can have up to 10 service nodes 
But the, the only difference with this one, if you are talking SIP to SIP, the connection is still there. But by the time this one goes down, this one will be your SN1. Mm -hmm. It will switch. But the problem is for those who are going to lift the phone during the redundancy transition, they, they have to wait for five minutes before they will get the dial tone. Unlike the HFT, it's right away. So that is N plus one. Some companies, they still do this. In road transportation, they are doing it. In road transportation, they have six limbs, but they have two cluster. Remember, one cluster, 10. But then they said, uh, no, I will have two cluster. I have six limbs. So one, three, and five will be cluster one. Two, four, and six will be cluster two. So they have, they don't want to rely because the problem is if this one goes down while this one is down, I, I don't know what to do with that one because I only have one redundant server to carry the load of this service node. That's why it's called N plus one. It will carry only, uh, it will carry the load from only one. <laughs> only one service node that went down. Okay. If two down, it will take only one. Yes, and it depends on who is the priority. Exactly. Okay, there is also prioritization on the program. So this is N plus one. We call it N plus one. Now let's go to the other option. Now we have one plus one preload. One plus one is different. Service node three, service node two, service node one. All of them are connected on the same network again, but because it's one plus one, this will be a little bit expensive. You will have SN1 redundancy, SN2 redundancy, SN3 redundancy. That's why it's a little bit expensive. Each server will rely on its own redundant server. So replicating each server with its own. Three to five minutes. Of transitioning the redundant server because why is it that long? If this system goes down, this particular redundancy is checking the heartbeat of each server. So it will take time for him to check. When this one goes down, it will still check the others first before let's say, okay, I have a priority, slim two is down and leave one is down. Who is my priority? See, so this server is thinking who will he serve first. In N plus one, it's different. When this one is down, automatically this will kick in. But still, there will be a downtime for 30 seconds. Much lesser than that one. That's why Whenever there is a tender or a requirement for high availability. For one plus one, uh, <coughs> there is one redundancy for each server. Yes. That's why it's called one plus one. So in a tender, if there is a requirement for 99.9 .9 availability, we always tell them go with virtual machine. Mm -hmm. Now, in some cases, the customer said, nah, virtual machine is too expensive. What, do you, what can you provide to us? So we will tell them we have N plus one, we have one plus one. So if you think that this one is much cost effective than the VMware, because VMware, I can download a Hyper-V. Mm -hmm. I can put my instances there, mm -hmm. but you cannot use any feature of VMware, not unless you buy the license. And how much is a license of VMware for you to have an HANFT? So you have to do the costing. So it depends on the 
on the customer. If the customer says, ah, anyway, I don't, I don't have a virtual environment, so let's go with maybe this or that. So it all depends on the requirement. But you have to tell them about the number of downtime. Right? Does, does this, uh, of course, if you have an analog call, then it will be dropped automatically. Only the, only the SIP phones will not be dropped when you are on a call. Okay? Now, going back to his question. So we are, we are clear with the redundancy. Uh, is there any other question before I go to that? One, one, one thing. Yeah. If we are in one plus one preloaded scenario and call is mature from SN1, SIP call, two parties are calling uh, through SN1 and during the call SN1 goes down then SN1 redundant server will take uh, effect in 30 seconds will this call be disconnected or that will be continued for if, 30 seconds if, if it's a SIP call the, the call is continued will continue it will not be dropped not unless you put down the phone and then lift it again you will not get any dial tone in 30 seconds. Okay, okay. During, not what well, I mean, during the transition of the redundant server kicking in, then you, you will not get any dial tone. But if you are on an ongoing call and you are using SIP, you don't need to worry because it will not be dropped. Right, right. Okay. Now, let's go to the other part. What time is it? 12? <laughs> so you just have to tell me when you want to have your lunch. <laughs> because I, 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 I will keep on. I know that uh, the guys here will, will go for prayer at 12, 12.30, 12.40. Then from there, we will stop. Maybe you can have your lunch as well. We will give you an hour for lunch time, and then we will resume. Is that okay for you guys? Yes, yeah, sure, yes. sure. Uh, okay. Yes, I think it's fair time here in Pakistan. Yeah. Okay, okay. And it's good for Pakistan or Bangladesh. They are two hours behind us, uh, ahead of us. That's why I'm asking, okay? Okay, so this is clear. No, no more questions? Now let's go to the other redundancy. Now, if you look at your ASU for industrial server, to have a redundant server in CPQ, you will see there is a network and server redundancy. It depends in which, which type of redundancy you're going to have. It's either server redundancy only without network or network and server redundancy. Normally, we always put server and network redundancy. Now, what is network redundancy? On your ASU or on your ISS, we require you to have two NIC cards. Okay. The first NIC card, that will be your main layer two switch, okay? So maybe you have 192.168.1.x. Now, the other ethernet port that you have on your ASU2 will be connected to another layer switch, okay? This one might be 192.168. It can be the same IP. Uh, it can be the same subnet, but the different IP. Yeah. Okay. It's just a matter of how you configured your layer switch. Or it can be on a different subnet. So that when the system, when this switch goes down, this one will do the redundancy and continue the, the, the workability of your system. And your phone. Of course, you, you are doing the natting, the forwarding, and so on. On the system side, 
it creates an alias IP address. Because when you install the system, you are putting the fixed IP address, which is on your ETH0. And when you do network bonding, okay, then you configure what will be the IP address of the second network, which is your LAN1. To be able to do this, you must have a network redundancy uh, license as well. Okay, this is the only uh, on the only main reason why you have network redundancy. Now, funny thing, we have an installation. When I was working with Atom, the client what he did, he have a redundant server, but all of the system are connected on one CO line. So when the CO line went down, everything, even the redundant server went down. And then they gave us a switch. We told them it has to be different subnet or if it is on the same switch. What happened is that the main switch where these are connected went down. So both of them also went down. So you have to design it. There are some design specification on the document that you need to follow. Okay. And funny thing, there was, I forgot the, the I forgot the, the, what they called about the network. When it Should went up, it up, there will be, there will be a ghost IP something that happened to the system. I, 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 I will get that on that one. I forgot. <laughs> Virtual IP. No, 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 there, there is another, uh, there is another name when the IP will, Will not match to each other. Sometimes it will, will not work. Confliction? I, I yeah, conflict. conflict. Yes. Okay. We, there is a, we are there RP is or HSRP. No, it's a different. Uh, there is what we call. I, I forgot about it. I, I will check it again. Okay. So that is your network redundancy. Okay. Simple as that. So you have to use the ETH0 and ETH1. And during the installation, you have to provide the IPs if you're going to do this. Network bonding, we call it network bonding. Okay, yeah, 124 system, 15 media gateways for each server. Okay, it can be, no, I, I don't wanna say it can be mixed because we don't have it anymore. So you will use the 3U chassis. Again, this is the name. Okay. If a provisioning manager is installed in server one where the service node manager, server one is equipped with the low amount of physical, that's why we increase the, the, the memory of the ASU if you're going to install the provisioning manager. Okay. Because there is a capacity uh, limitation on the MGU. Network redundancy utilizes the network bonding facility in Linux. So these are more in Linux. Now, I have received one, one information. I don't know who, what, who was it. They want to change the IP address of the system, a working system. With Mitel, it's not allowed. We don't allow. It. So you have to reinstall the system if you want to change the IP addresses of the server. Why? Because of the database. The database has its own IP address again as well. But and the thing is, we are not controlling the IP. Linux is controlling the IP. So every time you put an IP address, that is based on Linux, not on the telephone. So if we, we have to change, then we have to start from? From scratch, install the system, put the backup, that's all. Doing the backup is you know, easy. Sometimes what we think, uh, we think uh, we, uh, in office, we think, <coughs> Just configure everything here, and we'll do test everything here. Then we'll install. It. You can do that as well. But there is the issue. Uh, sometimes we don't know the uh, submitting yeah. of, of the customers. Yeah, that's the that's problem. What, yes, that is the issue. Yeah. Uh, so we put any IP, then. Ah no, no, you cannot do that. You have to have the right IP of the customer to be able to do that. Or else, again, as I mentioned to you, you cannot. And it's not allowed to change the IP. Uh, you can change it in Linux, but once you change it, there are some telephony that is looking up 
to the IP address that you set during the initial setup. Okay. Okay, service node installation. <coughs> That's why I told you this will be this will be I'm a boring scenario. scenario. Sorry? There is a scenario here. If we have a running system with the uh, let's say one point uh, one ninety two one sixty eight one dot ten subnet IP. Uh, and uh, uh, everything is running fine, and I have okay. took the complete backup of the system. But okay. after some time, the client wants to change the subnet. Uh, let's say they go with the 10.5.4.5 something. Okay. And I install a new system, new MX1, let's say on virtual machine. Can okay. I use that backup which I have took uh, previously uh, for this new system? Yes, you can use that backup, but there are some parts of the backup that still has the IP address. For example, yes. the media. So you have then to edit. That? So you have to edit that backup before you submit mm -hmm. it to. The okay. Okay, I I just can't put the backup uh, on the running config uh, running server. If you put it there, will you will have some errors because of the different IP addresses. That's why, if you want to make sure, get all the information where the IP address is included in that backup and change it manually before you submit it to the system. Okay. 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 Let's say, let's say I have a media way. I have an MGU. An MGU, you have to set an IP address on your MGU. So if you put that backup to the system and your MGU is going to use a different IP, once the system uploaded the backup, it will give you errors. Now, problem is you will find those errors later on when the whole system is back installed with the backup then now you are going to have a problem and you don't know where is the problem okay that's why you need to check it you need to edit it okay 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 you got it okay more information uh, i know i'm getting i'm also getting bored with this uh service node installation things that you might want to know and you need to know we do have a third key solution the customer has bought both server software from Mitel. In this case, operating systems slash and media kit contain, containing MX1 software. We call it turnkey. Those are the recovery DVD and USB DVD, a uh, USB uh, uh, thumb drive. Software only refers to a media kit that it will be provided to the client because the client will be buying their own uh, server and they need to install their own SUSE Linux with a compatible service pack. Okay. The OS needs to be installed on the server for details, of course. Timing is very important versus NTP time source must be accessible. That's why NTP is a must. Without NTP, you cannot continue the installation. So we need an NTP device or NTP. Yes. Now there, there is one confusion with 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 when I did that training with Bangladesh. So how does NTP work? That's why I told them much better go to Google and Google it. How NTP works. So we have an MX1. This is our MX1. We do have an IP. Let's say 192.168.1.10. That is my IP on EP0. When you install it, you have to provide a lot of IPs. We will talk about that. What are the IPs? And the IP has to be static, not DHCP. Okay. This is common to all call managers. It has to be static. Now, during the installation, it will ask you for your NTP 
server. Of course, that is another IP address. How does NTP work? An NTP, you can have another server that is hosting your NTP, or we call it NTP server. It can be Windows 2016 server, 2019 server, that can be an NTP service. Windows 10, you cannot use it. Uh, if you go to Microsoft, the only application or Microsoft Windows operating system that can be an NTP server is the server-based uh, application, the OS, okay? Now, even though we have a server here and then you activate it, activate the NTP server, this one, my system during the installation will check that NTP service. Okay. And that NTP server has to send back information. Now, will this one work? No. This one also need to rely on your internet where it will sync the NTP service, okay? For example, I'm always using this one. I'm also I'm always using that one for uh, for Dubai. So this NTP server will not be recognized by your service node manager, not unless it is connected to the internet. Now going back to your to what you said, you can buy an NTP server device. This is now common. And this NTP server device has an antenna where it connects to the internet. And of course, it, it will be connected to the network. It's the same thing as the server. I have one, uh, we have our professional service. They did an installation in I think in Sri Lanka, they have two separate MX1 in different locations. Problem is your service node one and service node two must have a synchronized NTP. Unfortunately, in this place, they cannot provide an NTP and on the other one. So what they, what, what they did is they bought a China-made device, an NTP server, which connects to the internet. So how does it connect to the internet? Of course, you have chips, yeah, GPS. GPS, GPS location. So this one, they connected to the network and they able to have the synchronized. The thing is, if you have two different NTP service, there will be jitters, which, that, which will not give you the synchronized time of, for the system. That's why, this is a no-no if you don't have an internet. That's why you should always have an internet. If you don't want this, this is too expensive, buy this device that will do GPS for your NTP server. I, 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 will, I will ask that guy what is the name so that you can check it out if in case you need it, okay? okay. <coughs> so, question. Yes. So, uh, some of my existing clients have this time issue because uh, yes. uh, their banks and they uh, don't allow outside internet connectivity to the server or their NTP server, I guess. So, in that case, uh, some of the users are getting to uh, two plus hour, um, uh, two plus hour in actual than actual time. They are uh, yeah. providing us their internal NTP server and. Uh, as you described earlier, now I'm guessing that that NTP server don't have either internet connection. So yes. is there any way? Is there any way to uh, manually configure the time if the no. NTP server or the server? No. Uh, during the 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 old version of MX1, it is allowed to use MX1 as the NTP service. Whatever is the time of my controller will be the time for all the folks. They stopped it. Michael said no, because it's using too much resources between your server and Linux and your telephony. 
Now, I would suggest because as I mentioned to you, this Sri Lanka is a navy. So it's a government. Government doesn't allow you to give any internet to your to any any devices because it will be a security issue. That's why you can use this part. Mm -hmm. Because this one doesn't need an internet. It only needs GPS location where it is location. satellite location. That's it. And you just connect it to the network. Nobody can hack this. Nobody can connect to it. Okay? Because it's GPS. So this is the yes, we have also connected. We have also deployed NTP server device uh, with satellite for NTP in yeah. the defense system. It's then very cheaper, uh, cheaper device, cheaper device. So maybe you can share with the others what is that device? Yeah, sure, sure. It's Chinese device and it's very cheaper. And no, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It is yeah. one way of going it that way. If if this is a government facility. That does it does not provide an internet, then go with that one. What is the cost of this device? Okay. Very little. Very little. No? Let, let, in let's... Pakistan, in Pakistani rupees, it is forty-five thousand. I believe it is uh, three hundred dollars or for three hundred dollars maximum. Ah, there will be much cheaper. My 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 friend who did this in Navy, I think less than hundred. So the, so yes, it's less device. Device. yes, I will tell you what is that device. I will ask him. Okay. And uh, the integration is uh, very simple, right? Just uh, yes, put yes. that device connected to the MSO. Configuration is very simple as well. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Let me drink some water. Yes, yes. Now, another one, another way is through virtual appliance, as I mentioned to you a while ago. KBM equivalent. So the one with the EX, okay? Uh, um, with this document, you are not seeing the Azure because Azure was on 7.4. The information is on 7.4. It can be a ESXi hypervisor or a Linux-based KVM hypervisor as well. Okay. So what are the things that you need? IPv4, it will ask you what are you going to use. Up to four IP addresses required. What are those IP address? Base IP address, alias address for Cassandra, alias address for server redundancy, if you need redundancy, alias IP address for media server. So those are what you need. Now, of course, static IP, it has to be static IP. Depending on whether Cassandra is installed on server 2 and about determining if that alias IP address is required. So it depends. Running traditional hardware or virtual or mixed environment, yes, you can create a media gateway together with your uh, virtual machine. CPE installation or cloud, so on prem. It's either you, you install it on prem or Azure. It, it depends how you're going to use it. So which licensing method will be used? So we do have two types of licensing. One is standard, one is featured based. So standard is the typical license where you add as many users as you want, analog, digital, and so on. Feature based refers to unified communication. If you have unified communication, we will add those licenses in the system itself. How many servers will be hosting copies of Cassandra? It will be part of the installation. And prerequisite, physical server must be in place. 
My Voice MX1 server must be available as media kit. Of course, it will be part of that one. That's why I don't want to read all these things because it just keep on repeating, repeating whatever information you need. Okay. So again, software only if, you, if the client provides. And then this is the start of the installation of the system. Okay. So this is the USB. The turnkey is the recovery DVD. This is the package bin file. Rules change me. Yeah. So when you do when you do that, that will be installed when you install it on virtual and uh, DVD. But right now we're going to do OVA. That's why you will not see it. But for the other people online, uh, as I mentioned to you. Because I am not there, and maybe this is your first time installing it, I don't want you to crash your system. Not unless you are, um, you want to install it, but you have to take your own risk, okay? Because uh, it, it will take a lot of time to tell you how to do things online. I, I will show it to you. I will show you the, the ways, but... Uh, Installing it not now, maybe later on after after the two weeks training. If you really want to try it, I will guide you without stopping this training session that we have here. So if your system is up and running, leave it as it is. Okay. Um, and there are things that we need to check later on. Okay, virtual appliance, we will we'll just load the OVA file to the virtual machine. And when you upload it, what happens is that the operating system is already loaded. You just need to log into the system and do the net setup to start the configuration of your telephone. So there are step-by-step, -step, which I already have in the other documents that I shared to you. Just information what you are doing. For example, this one, basic networking settings are activated. The system will then prompt information about the time and NTP settings. So it's really important. So maybe with NTP server, we also need gateway address. Must be. Uh, the gateway address will be later on when you are going to add a 3U or you are going to use a media server. So this is not important in the installation part. It will be later on if you are going to activate all the cards. Then uh, we will. We will do it step by step, how, how to do it, okay? <coughs> the next part will be no redundancy. Again, these are the explanation. If there is no redundancy, everything is on the same subnet. If something goes down, that's it. It will not work. Network redundancy using switch network redundancy, meaning you have two layer switch, okay? And then it might be on the same subnet, Okay, or it can be on a different subnet. Obtaining digital certificate. Now, obtaining digital certificate is automatic in 7.4, you need to provide. But the problem with, uh, with this one, you only have one year. You have to get a certificate, renew the certificate so that you can use it again. Okay? But this is not a mital certificate it's a third party certificate okay so that you can secure if you want to access the system https you must have a certificate okay design scenario again uh, it depends how you're going to install the the cassandra but i will show it to you so this is one example of that one service node has its own cassandra database the rack information there is just if I have a data center, which rack it is located? That's as simple as that. Okay. So I have one data center. I have three service, five service nodes, and I can install the Cassandra database to where I want, or I can install it on all of them. It all depends on you. You can have two data centers separate them with different uh, Cassandra database. Same thing as the redundancy. 
the, the, the way we do the redundancy. You can have, again, each Cassandra will have its own, uh, each service node will have, will have its own Cassandra. As you can see, it's only location. The rack is just a location where it is located, the server is located. These are just a short list. If you want to write it down when you're doing installation, what will be the IP address, what will be this, just a preparation when you are doing the installation, okay? We need an IP address for our server slash CIDR. It's talking about the subnet, subnet CIDR, okay? So don't forget to put, for example, if I put 192.168, that one, that 10 slash 24. If your subnet is 255255. IP gateway, host name can be any name. If if it is a customer, I can I can put a name server one or server two. That will be the name of your server. So not for me. I, I practice this one, MX1, SBR1, MX1, SBR2. Again, it's just a name. Uh, it has to be caps lock. Not really, but uh, normally I do everything caps lock. Domain name, if you have a domain name, put it there, because maybe later on you want to have a QFDN, so you can search, you can access it. By a domain name. Alias IP address for Cassandra is required another static IP. Alias IP address for RTP. Uh, right now, this is not needed. If you will see the installation. NTP server, it is now mandatory. So you must have that NTP server. If there is no NTP server specified, the system installation will fail. Mm -hmm. 100%. So you cannot continue. Just tell me when to stop for the prayer. Yes, it's been. Because after 1215, uh, it will start. 1250? Name it. No, no. 1215. It's already started. It's 1237. Yes, I know. That's why I told once uh, you was on the way. That's why I, I, I did not. <laughs> okay. We can stop from here. No problem. No. You, you, you can have the prayer. Yeah. Okay, guys, uh, we're going to stop here. We're going to continue later. Um, you can have your, you can have your lunch, your, uh, uh, I don't know how you call it because your time is different. Uh, you can have your prayer okay. as well. Okay. Okay, let's so, take a lunch and prayer break. break. We'll in one hour time, is that okay? Okay. Okay, okay. 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 Thank you.